Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. I have a story that illustrates the difference between stakeholder capitalism and shareholder capitalism. And this also points out the hypocrisy of a lot of these big corporate CEOs. They tend to be on the tech sector, but they're, they're all over the place. And it also shows their affiliation with the World Economic Forum, if you connect the dots. And uh, we're going to be doing that in this video. So let's dive in. The first thing I want to go over is everyone's favorite disciple of Mr. Klaus Schwab himself. That is Mark Benioff. One of my favorites. <laughs> and I mean, I don't want to attack his the way he looks or his personality, but I'm going to show a video of Milton Friedman. And I'd, I'd really like to, I'd, I'd challenge each and every one of you to look at the video of Benioff and then look at Friedman and just ask yourself, who do you trust more? Just regardless of, of what they say, regardless of their position or if you agree with them or not, just their, their mannerisms and the way they, they speak. There's a lot that we can conclude by looking at someone's body language. And just their the, the tonality of their voice and the way they articulate or enunciate, or just the way they kind of move and behave and kind of look you in the eye or don't look you in the eye. And I don't want to make too big of a deal of it, but just when we're watching these clips, just kind of ask yourself, hmm, who, who would I trust more if I just kind of met them on the street for 30 seconds, something like that. But first, let's get into this tweet. And this was from September 22nd. Or Benioff, and the backstory to this is he, the Texas came out with this abortion law. And he said that any of the employees that he had in Texas, some of the effect that he'd be happy to relocate them. Or let's see what he says here. The discuss offer to relocate workers in Texas after abortion law takes effect. So for any of those workers who just cannot stand, living in Texas anymore, and they want to flee the state and go to California, well, Mark Benioff is offering to pay for their U-Haul truck. <laughs> and I would like to see the numbers of people who have actually moved from California to Texas and then compare that to the numbers that have moved from Texas to California, even after this law. My guess is that you're going to see a landslide of people moving from California to Texas and not vice versa. But he he says this to, it looks like ABC News Live, or he reiterates his position here. He makes this offer, and then he tweets about it. He says, why is it such a big deal when a CEO says that if their employees are being targeted... They will support them and offer them a safe haven. Isn't that what all CEOs do? Stand up for their employees and their employees' human rights and always have their employees' backs? Fair enough statement from Mr. Benioff. Now let's go over to an article. This is entitled, Major Tech Companies to Require Medicine Vat medicine Mandates or the Medicine for Workers on Campus. And they point out that Google is one of these companies. And wouldn't you know it, right here, Salesforce. The last time I checked, Mark Benioff, the... the the person who is standing at the CEO that's taking a stance and standing up for his employees and their human rights. I think he's the one that is the CEO of Salesforce. And Salesforce here says, or this article is talking about Salesforce. A few other companies have been doing so, including Morgan Stanley, Salesforce, San Francisco's largest private employer, required its first batch of returning workers to have the medicine, Re and let me make sure you guys got that word, required. 
not giving them the option, not respecting their personal choice and liberty, but required like an authoritarian dictator. And then the spokesperson goes on to say, proudly talks about how they're taking an, an authoritarian approach to this and they're not giving their workers an option. They're not treating them humanely. They're not treating them as though they have rights and they are individuals. And this gal, Cheryl, claims this as though it's some sort of badge of honor, like she's bragging about it. We are the first major tech company to introduce this science-based, safety-first approach. Okay, well, let's, again, let's just go back to Mr. Benioff's tweet. Why is it such a big deal for, when a CEO stands up for their employees? the employees who are being targeted? Why is it a big deal to support them and offer them a safe haven? Why is it a big deal for CEOs when they stand up for their employees' human rights and always have their employees' backs? Hypocrite much, Mr. Benioff? And you see, the reason I bring this up is to point out this difference, well, first of all, the influence from the World Economic Forum. Let, let's address the elephant in the room. Whenever you hear Benioff, Biden, Trudeau, they all are, they just parrot whatever it is that Klaus is saying at, at any given time. It's almost like they have a script that Klaus and his assistant come up with, and then they email it to Biden and Trudeau and Benioff, and they say, okay, guys, next time you go in the media, these are the words that you need to use. This is the narrative you need to push. Like it, it, it's some sort of uh, coordinated effort. All right, so that's the first thing that we need to be aware of. That my, my guess is it's not coming from Benioff, that he's just a useful idiot. Emphasis on the idiot. And the way that you dissect this further is by looking at the difference of something that he and Klaus and Biden and Trudeau talk about all the time, something called stakeholder capitalism. And they always just really condemn shareholder capitalism. And in doing so, they always talk crap about Milton Friedman. Always. I mean, just Google Milton Friedman and Mark Benioff. And you can see posts where he just goes off on freedom, uh, uh, Friedman, excuse me, and freedom for that matter. And then Klaus does the exact same thing. Well, what did they have against Milton Friedman? I mean, he was someone that stood up for individuals, for liberty, for freedom, and free market capitalism. But you see, that in and of itself is what they hate. And when you just listen to what they say and connect the dots, it's all very obvious. And whether it is with the, the uh, medicine mandates, whether it's with climate change, something we've been talking about today, they could they, they always use these um, kind of they always use these um, these narratives as a Trojan horse. You see, they're just it, it's not about what it's about. And that's what you have to realize. But what's interesting is if you don't peel back the layers of the onion, it's very hard to come to this conclusion because you take it at face value. Let's use stakeholder capitalism as an example. Benioff will come out and say, oh, capitalism is dead. What we have to do is we have to evolve as a society and we have to be more fair and inclusive and we can't just be concerned with, a, with just profits alone. And at face value, most people look at that and say, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Great idea. But you see, they don't understand what's happening beneath the surface. They don't understand the true intentions because they don't take that to its logical conclusion. And, that, and therefore, they don't see that although these global elite are backing all of these initiatives, such as climate change, stakeholder capitalism, in the name of the greater good, in reality, they're doing it for their own self-interest to gain more power and more control. Let me 
give you a specific example. Let's go back to stakeholder capitalism. This is this idea that you shouldn't be focused on profits alone. You should be focused on the greater good. The corporation should. Okay, well, let's think about this. Who is in charge of what the greater good is? Let's just say that Salesforce this year makes a billion dollars in profit. And instead of giving that profit to their shareholders, they decide to take 500 million of that and allocate it to benefiting society. Well, who controls where that 500 million is spent? Well, that would be Benioff. Well, do you think that that gives him any additional power to be charitably spending or have ac- or have uh, to have access to five hundred million dollars and to be able to distribute that to whatever entity or whatever individual he wants? And then, if Klaus is, let's say, influencing Benioff, then how much power does that give Klaus? And let's just assume that there's. 50, 100, 1,000 CEOs that do the same thing. This is corporatism. (laughs) Don't you see that? And let's think through who the shareholders are. So what we're doing is we're taking money away from shareholders. That's essentially what they're saying here. And they're saying, oh, we're doing it for the greater good, but then they just don't tell you that they're going to be holding the purse strings. They're the ones that are going to be allocating this $500 million. Well, if Benioff wasn't spending, giving away that $500 million for the greater good to whatever pet project he had to gain power and control, that would be going to the shareholders. Well, who are the shareholders? They're just individuals like you or I. So can't, so isn't it right? Isn't it morally and ethically correct? to give the shareholders that money so they can, if they want, contribute to any charity that they want to contribute to. You see, so what Benioff is doing is he's saying, listen, you shareholders, you're not smart enough to make moral decisions. So I need to make decisions for you based on my morals and the morals of my leader, Klaus Schwab. You see, and I I could go into this in great detail, but I think you guys get it. Whenever they talk about stakeholder capitalism and whenever they paint this picture as though it's going to benefit society, in reality, when you actually think it through, it benefits society less and it gives them the power to distribute that money to whomever they see fit instead of distributing it to the actual shareholders where they could make a moral decision on where that money goes based on their conscience and not based on the whims of Benioff, Bigglesworth, and Klaus Schwab. So what is fair, quote unquote, for society? What is the most fair system for the teachers, the firefighters, the policemen, the union workers, the average Joe and Jane, who are actually shareholders of Salesforce. What's most fair to them? Is it to allow Benioff and Klaus to spend all the profits in the name of the greater good? Or is it to actually give it to them so they can spend it or they can allocate it on the way they see fit? See, that's the deceptive part of this. That's the smoke and mirrors game that the global elite always play. And that's how they get the the, the useful idiots using the term that, that the way Lenin and Stalin used it. That's how they get these do-gooders. That's what Milton Friedman used to call them, the do-gooders, to go out there and do their bidding. Because you see, they sell the do-gooders on the fact that this is going to accomplish the objective of increasing the standard of living for the poor and middle class. So the do-gooders go out there and they get all excited about it. Yeah, stakeholder capitalism. Yeah, yeah. Capitalism is bad. Capitalism is dead. Milton Friedman, bad. Let's go out there and, and they don't think through the fact that by transitioning from this form of capitalism to this form, to the global elite's form, 
They're not benefiting society. They're only benefiting the global elite. This is the game they're playing, whether it's with stakeholder capitalism or whether it's climate change or anything else. It's just a Trojan horse. So let's keep going here. And this is another tweet from my buddy, Benioff. Capitalism as we know it and as Milton Friedman defined it. You notice when he can't just say capitalism is dead. He always has to throw Milton Friedman under the bus. And that for, for me, that is a huge red flag because you can like or dislike Milton Friedman. You can agree with him or not agree with him. But the fact that they're taking one individual that for a lot of people represents free market capitalism and throwing them under the bus, uh, under the uh, bus with every opportunity they get, it shows you that their target really isn't the individual. Their target is free market capitalism, individualism, freedom, and liberty itself. He goes on to say, as Milton Friedman defined it, as being purely shareholder-based is dead. We are seeing the emergence of a new capitalism based on stakeholders, where it's as important to have a stakeholder return as a shareholder return. But no matter how he spins it, what he is saying is we need to move away from this system that gives the decision-making process to the individuals in the real economy, and we need to move towards a system that gives me all the power to make the decisions. So let's hear, I hate to even play this, but uh, let, let's we'll go ahead and put the closed captions on, or no, here we go. All right, so let me try to play it here. I'll turn up the volume on this. Hopefully you guys can hear it. And uh, let's hear what, uh, I just can't stand listening to this guy, but let's hear what he has to say. And if you're not, then you're not going to really exist, I think, in this environment. You know, I, I really strongly believe that capitalism as we know it is dead. That we're going to see a new kind of capitalism. See, if, so if you didn't hear that first part, I apologize for the video. We're working on getting that integrated into our software. But what he's saying is that now we need to have this new form of capitalism that has greater morals and ethics. You see, the problem with that is who determines what is moral? Who determines what our ethical values are? Is it you watching this video? Is it the do-gooder? Is it the useful idiot? Is it the average Joe and Jane? Is it the poor and middle class? No. It's going to be Benioff. And at the end of the day, it's going to be Klaus and the global elite. All right. We have any super chats, Josh? Okay, Jorish, Joris, what happens if the entire float of stock is directed, owned through computer share and still more than 100% shorted? VW short squeeze? Well, yeah, I mean, it could set up for a short squeeze, but just because there's more shares shorted then there are outstanding shares. It doesn't necessarily mean that something is nefarious or something nefarious is going on because you can take those same shares and when you sell them short, what are you doing? You're, you're selling them to someone else that, that now has those shares and they can sell them short. So it, it, it's, it's, my point is yes, it could set up for a good short squeeze, although I, I would never make that bet. That's not the way I invest but it could set up the dynamics for a short squeeze. But that in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that that there's something nefarious going on, meaning that they're issuing some like more shares and are out there, or there's like uh, paper shares that, that don't really exist, uh, that just exist on like the ghost ledger between banks or something like that. Uh, not really. It's it, You got to look at it like velocity. So 
can you pay off $20 of debt worth with $10? Yes, you can. You absolutely can. It just depends on the velocity. If that $10 circulates fast enough, you can still pay off $20 of debt if only $10 exist in an economy. And it's 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 a similar thing here with uh with if there's more of a, a short interest in a stock than there are shares outstanding. All right, Rob, why not to be rebel capitalists enough to dump Shibu Inu on the plebs? I mean, it's an opportunity, if you understand. Yeah, I mean, if you're a trader, Rob, I, I mean, listen, ethically, morally, you got to make that decision on your own if you want to just pump and dump. The, or not pump and dump, but just dump it on someone, the greater fool, let's say that. If you're a, a, a trader, I mean, this could be a strategy, but this is just, you don't have an edge in this. You really don't. It may be a quick trade. You may win the bet and make some money. But at the end of the day, if you continue to make your investment decisions based on just hype and emotion, and I'm saying you're taking an emotional stance, but you're 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 taking advantage of the hype and um, you're not doing fundamental research. You're not buying the underlying asset. You're not buying value. You're just buying something because you think the price is going to go up. In my humble opinion, if you do that over the long run, you're going to end up a loser or losing money, I should say. Um, sure, you can hit on a 19 and get 21 if you're playing blackjack. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good decision, even if you get the 21. Because if you continue to do that, then the probabilities are against you. You do not have an edge. The house has the edge. And based on the law of large numbers, if you do that over time, mathematically, you are going to lose money. So I'm not saying that you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. I mean, that's up to every individual to make their own decision. I'm just saying, in my opinion, that's not what I do because I don't think long-term you can have an edge there. And uh, I always like to just stick with the, the fundamentals. I don't, I try to completely ignore price direction. I like to start off by asking myself the question, is it cheap or is it expensive? I never, ever, ever ask myself, is the price going up or down? I think that's what I'm trying to say. All right. Any other super chats, Josh? All right, I guess that's it. Guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Remember to continue to stand up, fight for freedom.